Seth Brundle has invented something that could change the world. He invites a journalist, Veronica Quaife, into his warehouse laboratory to witness the seemingly impossible as he teleports matter from one place to another with devices he calls telepods. As Seth and Veronica get closer to each other, his experiments in teleportation escalate until, one fateful night, he uses himself as a subject. Unbeknownst to Seth, however, a simple housefly is in the telepod with him, and when they both teleport, their genetic material gets spliced together, beginning a process whereby Seth Brundle gradually metamorphoses into Brundlefly, a monstrous hybrid of man and insect. As his humanity slips away, he alienates Veronica, who discovers to her horror that she is now pregnant with their offspring. Brundlefly discovers this and kidnaps her, now mad with the idea that he can cure his inhumanity by splicing together himself, Ronnie, and the unborn baby into one single abomination. Before we get started, if you could do me a solid and hit that like button, it would go a long way to pleasing the brutal, unforgiving YouTube algorithm. Also, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I can't dive deep into the plasma pool without your support, so thank you in advance. With that out of the way, let's get back to the subject at hand. With science fiction horror ascendant in the mid-80s, a young screenwriter named Charles Pogue was commissioned by producers Kip Oman and Stuart Kornfeld, with the blessing of 20th Century Fox, to write a modern remake of 1958's The Fly. Pogue kept the general premise of Langland's original story, but changed the details to reflect modern times and a more modern understanding of the science. He took out the framing device, added some 80s-style corporate intrigue, and, most importantly, changed the transformation at the heart of the story into something gradual. Though it is a clever reimagining of the source material, 20th Century Fox was unhappy with the script and would only distribute it if another production studio came on board. Stuart Kornfeld, who had become very passionate about the project, then turned to Mel Brooks, with whom he'd recently collaborated on The Elephant Man. Brooks agreed to produce the film under the Brooks Film banner. Their first choice to direct was David Cronenberg, a Canadian director who'd made a name for himself as one of the greats of the genre, specializing in the kind of visceral body horror that Pogue had put into the story. Unfortunately, at the time, Cronenberg was busy working on Total Recall with Dino De Laurentiis and wasn't terribly enthusiastic about Pogue's screenplay, so Kornfeld and Brooks had to find someone else. They settled on Robert Bierman, a young British director with practically no major film experience but who had good ideas for how to tackle the project. Not long before the film was scheduled to go into production, though, Bierman suffered a massive personal tragedy when his daughter died in an accident. Production came to a halt for several months, and Brooks insisted on holding the production in that state until Bierman could decide for himself if he wanted to move forward with the project. Ultimately, Bierman decided he simply couldn't, and so Brooks and Kornfeld had to go back to the drawing board. During this time, creative differences between Dino De Laurentiis and David Cronenberg had come to a head during pre-production on Total Recall, and Cronenberg was ready to walk away. As a result, Brooks again went to him with Pogue's script, now offering full creative control along with twice the funding of Cronenberg's last film, The Dead Zone. For Cronenberg, this was an offer too good to pass up, and so he quit work on Total Recall and started writing his own screenplay for The Fly. It helped that he retained a love for insects, as someone who'd been a junior entomologist as a kid. Though Cronenberg reimagined all of the characters and tweaked a lot of the plot, the core of his script is still very close to Pogue's, the sequences you'd most expect to have come from Cronenberg, like the grotesque inside-out test monkey and the disgusting sequence at the mirror, are ripped almost word for word from Pogue's screenplay. Cronenberg's contribution was to highlight a love triangle that was less prominent in Pogue's script and to change the two main characters from a married couple to a courting one, in effect restructuring the film as a romantic tragedy with characters more in line with Cronenberg's style. Later, when the Writers Guild was deciding who to credit for the final film, Cronenberg was adamant that Poe's contributions were given equal standing with his own. When it came to casting, Cronenberg settled on Jeff Goldblum for the male lead relatively early. Goldblum was known at the time for his supporting roles in 1978's Invasion of the Body Snatchers and 1983's The Big Chill, but he'd never been given a leading role in a major motion picture. Cronenberg wanted someone who could be not only believably geeky and scientific, which was natural for Goldblum, but also physically imposing. At six foot four, Goldblum was definitely tall enough, and the actor was perfectly willing to buff up for the more physically demanding aspects of the role. 
As such, Cronenberg fought hard to get him, even as 20th Century Fox was strongly against the idea. The actor's physical transformation would persist long after the film, and there is a distinctive difference between the scrawny Goldblum of Before the Fly and the more buff and frequently shirtless sex symbol he was after. For the female lead of Ronnie, Cronenberg again had to fight for his choice, this time Gina Davis. Davis, who had done mostly television work, was only really known in film for her supporting roles in Tootsie and Fletch, but she had a natural chemistry with Goldblum, no doubt enhanced by the fact that the two actors were dating. Cronenberg wanted Davis for that chemistry, but also because he needed an actress who could stand up to Goldblum's height. Gina Davis is six feet tall. As a side note, Davis and Goldblum married the year after The Fly was released, and then divorced in 1990. For the major supporting role, that of Stannis Barath- I mean Stathis Borens, Ronnie's eminently unlikable ex who turns into an unlikely hero in the final act, Cronenberg turned to John Getz, who impressed the director with his performance in the Coen Brothers' Blood Simple. Reality and fiction got a little too close for Goldblum during scenes in which Getz and Davis were together, and at one point, Goldblum got so jealous and disruptive seeing the two on set, he was asked to leave. There are a couple of notable cameos as well, with the Canadian heavyweight boxing legend George Chivalo, I'm assuming that's how it's pronounced, playing the arm wrestler who has a bad day, and Cronenberg himself playing the gynecologist in Ronnie's Dream who delivers a giant fly larva. It's easy to assume that Cronenberg chose to play the gynecologist because, well, he seems like the kind of guy who would, but it was actually Gina Davis who insisted he take the role, because she didn't trust anybody else to be in that position. With casting out of the way, Cronenberg hired Chris Wallace and his crew, who'd had a string of impressive successes with Raiders of the Lost Ark, Gremlins, and Enemy Mine, to tackle the daunting special effects and makeup work for Goldblum's transformation into Brundlefly. Wallace knew going into it that he and his team wouldn't have nearly enough time to do things properly, with a mere three months to put it all together before cameras would roll. Still, they were up to the challenge, eventually earning an Academy Award for their astonishing work. The designs of the telepods went through several iterations, starting life as rectangular glass cases similar to the pods from the original film. Cronenberg, a motorcycle and racing enthusiast, wanted a more mechanical and gritty look, and so he gave his prop department the engine of his Ducati Desmo. The rounded, gunmetal aesthetic was matched with the plethora of cooling fins to produce the final look. To score the film, Cronenberg hired Howard Shore, who'd also done the score for his previous films The Brood, Scanners, and Videodrome. Cronenberg is a director who likes to work with the same team on every film, and Howard Shore has gone on to score all of his major films, with the exception of The Dead Zone. For The Fly, Shore and Cronenberg sought out a heavy-handed sound that wasn't afraid to be bombastic and intense. It is an unusually effective match for this subject matter, and it should come as no surprise that in 2008, Shore would debut a full-blown opera based on The Fly. Test screenings went well, but many scenes were eventually dropped based on audience reaction, including an extensive sequence in which Brundlefly splices together the baboon with a cat, kills the resulting abomination with a lead pipe, and then laments his failure from the rooftop before biting off a fly appendage that emerges from his side. This entire sequence comes from Pogue's original script, and on its own, it's intense and terrifying. In the film, however, it chips away the audience's sympathy for what Brundle is going through, a sympathy that is absolutely essential for the final act to work. The only evidence of its absence in the theatrical version is the unexplained disappearance of the baboon halfway through the movie. Also cut were several different codas that followed Brundlefly's death. There was a bizarre, stop-motion animated dream sequence involving a butterfly baby, a revelation that Ronnie had ended up with Stathis and had decided to go through with the pregnancy, a revelation that she had ended up alone and without the baby, and more. However, none of these conclusions proved satisfying, and so Cronenberg eventually decided to end the film with the death of Brundlefly, leaving the ultimate fates of Ronnie, Stathis, and the baby up to the audience's imagination. One scene that got far more reaction than anybody expected was this scene, in which Brundle's ear falls off and Ronnie immediately hugs him, pressing her face right up to the place where the ear had been. It is definitely gross, and it's hard to watch the scene without having a visceral reaction, but in its own twisted way, it's one of the most touching moments in the entire film. Ronnie doesn't care about the fly slime, the vomit, or the gore. She isn't as horrified by the physical distress as she is by Brundle's suffering and she embraces him at his worst, trying in vain to ease that suffering. David Cronenberg's The Fly hit theaters in August of 1986 and earned nearly unanimous critical praise. 
It was a financial success, earning over $60 million at the box office and serving to this day as Cronenberg's most commercially viable film. It's also the only Cronenberg film to receive any kind of recognition at the Academy Awards, with Chris Wallace's makeup Oscar marking not only the sole win for a Cronenberg production, but also the only nomination. A sequel was greenlit by Fox, to be once again produced by Brooksville. The Fly 2, starring Eric Stoltz and Daphne Zuniga, released in 1989 with Chris Wallace taking over directing duties from a disinterested Cronenberg. Despite doing well at the box office, it doesn't live up to its predecessor and is remembered today as a bad misstep that swatted away any potential for a franchise. As for the themes of Cronenberg's film, a popular interpretation at the time is that this is about AIDS and or drug addiction, about watching someone die from either one. Cronenberg doesn't reject this, but his stated aim was a little broader. This is about anything that forces you to watch a loved one deteriorate, both physically and mentally, be it disease, addiction, or even old age, before ultimately having to resort to euthanasia. The euthanasia theme is present in the 1958 original film, but it is expanded here in far more detail and with far more harrowing effect. Cronenberg's choice to focus almost exclusively on the romantic angle of the story and to treat it as a tragic love story is what makes it so powerful. That brings me to the inevitable comparisons between the two films. Like with The Thing from Another World and its 80s remake, I'm not here to tell you which version of The Fly is superior on its own merits. These two films are just too different. The original is a slow-burn horror movie that relies on suspense and mystery, whereas this is an in-your-face full-frontal assault on the senses. Both films deserve attention and respect, and I don't think it's fair to make them compete with each other. That said, if you want to tell me which one is your favorite and why, feel free to sound off in the comments below. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. If you haven't done so already, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel for more content. If you want to give me even more support, check out my Patreon, where you can get early access, vote on future videos, get the occasional bonus video, and much more. You can also visit my website at emagill.com, where I offer written reviews of several science fiction classics in both film and literature. Until next time, this is the Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting anybody. Be afraid. Be very afraid.